I'm with Eric Thank de Haan, who is a professor at the Free University of Amsterdam, also at the Ashridge Coaching Center. And also, what we particularly love, because he embodies research theory and practice, so he has done some of the best research studies in coaching outcomes, a great a bunch of work on different theories, and is also a practicing coach. So, Eric, can you tell us just sum up a little bit of your coaching outcome research in a way that someone who didn't know your work could understand? Oh, wow, that's a good question, Carol. Thank you very much. I mean, essentially, I really enjoy doing research which is relevant to practice. So that's all I've done, uh, research into practice, into practicing coaches. Uh, not always myself, uh, because I'm, I might be biased in terms of, of, of the results, but in terms of what coaches do, whether it works, when it works, um, and what kind of impact coaching might have. So that's quantitative research. And I've also done some research on the qualitative side to explore what actually happens inside coaching conversations. Um, and the main research on the outcome side, so on the quantitative side, is first trying to show whether, uh, you know, that coaching is an effective intervention by having a, a randomized control group and a target group, and then looking for differences in outcome. If those groups are really randomized and really the same, and you find a difference uh, six months down the line, then that is a very good indication that coaching has made a difference if they are from the same population. So we've done that a few times. Um, and then we looked at, you know, what are factors that might impact outcome? So um, which coaches, which clients have a better outcome than others, for example, could be an interesting question, which we have posed in research. With all the, the research that you did with these different populations, did coaching actually help? So if I was trying to like, you know, talk to a company about coaching, could I say coaching helped and how? Yeah, we, we have some first indications now that coaching is a helpful intervention, just like similar interventions like mentoring or psychotherapy, which I haven't researched myself, uh, they've been demonstrated to be effective as well. Um, so what we see is that uh, coaching leads to a higher effectiveness in the eyes of, for example, the managers of the coaches, the coaches themselves and the coaches. Um, Another example is that coaches um, receive, um, reach to higher goal achievement. So they, they, they get more of their goals done within the period of coaching than the people in the control group. So that, those are both strong indicators that, um, yeah, even though coaching is only a few hours here and there, maybe 12 hours in total over that period, it's still an effective intervention. What impressed me about your research is that with the outcome measure, it wasn't just the coach saying, oh, it was wonderful, my client did well. It wasn't just the client saying, oh, it was great. Didn't you actually talk to the line managers or yes. have information from that? Yes, absolutely. So we had line manage management scores as well. Mm -hmm. um, and on all these scores from the different parties to the contract, so the line managers, uh, the coaches and the clients, we find uh, significant results. Of course, the, the results as, uh, you know, given to us by the clients, they are the highest results maybe. Maybe the managers are a little bit more kind of, you know, wait and see or doubtful. But if you take that statistically and you take large numbers, you can demonstrate that managers also see a beneficial effect coming from, from coaching. I think that's incredibly helpful to the field. <laughs> yes. We thank you for that. Oh, well. Well, I enjoy doing it and I enjoy reading it as well when there's many other people around the world who do this kind of research. Um, so what are the, you know, when you were doing this research, what, what aspects of the coaching actually you think led to those outcomes? Uh, yeah, so um, another very good question. So what we find more and more is that um, generic factors, as I would call them, or technically they're often called common factors, that they make a lot of difference. So those are factors that are present in every coaching intervention. And they don't really depend on uh, the techniques of the coach or the, where they trained or whether or not they are accredited or credentialed in any way. They are factors that are always there. For example, uh, the motivation of the client. 
that seems to be a very important factor. So whether we call it sometimes the placebo effect or the hope effect, if the client believes there is something in there or they want to give it a chance, that leads to higher outcomes. So, and you can influence that. When you're a company, you can maybe explain coaching better to people or take some more time before you start a coaching intervention. So you can work on this factor. Mm. Another one is uh, technically called self-efficacy. And that's the ability to self-motivate. So to find energy within yourself. And there's related factors like resilience or well-being or social support. They are all present in every coachee. And therefore, they don't depend on what school the coach went to or where the coaching has taken place. And they all have shown to be related to outcome. So those are some of the factors. And of course, there's the famous relationship factor as well. Yeah, tell so, me about that. <laughs> so there, is, uh, it, there are indications that the working alliance, which is a measurement of the quality of the relationship between cl client and coach, mm. that that also correlates with outcome. Um, uh, the working alliance means that there is agreement between coach and coachee about what they're there for, what they're doing, how they work together, agreement on the tasks. There is agreement on the goals, so they, they have the same goals for the coaching sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is what we call bond or chemistry or, you know, aff affiliation maybe between coach and client. And on each of these factors, uh, we also find that if that relationship is there, from the eyes of the coach or the client, hmm. you will get higher outcomes. That seems so important, particularly in situations where there might be internal coaching or places. So the connection is key. That's what I hear. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, certainly there is an overall um, higher effect if you have it, just like with hope. You know, if there's a positive connotation to coaching, then there is an increase in out outcome. If you look at the very few longitudinal studies that have been done, then maybe those factors are not that important in terms of what you take from each session. So that's a fascinating area for research for me at the moment mm -hmm. to see what exactly makes the difference session by session in terms of what the coach he takes from the session. So Eric, your work on the leadership shadow is really fascinating and has just huge applications, particularly to those of us who do leadership coaching with scary people. Can you <laughs> describe to people just your work with the leader shadow and what it is? Yes. Um, I've always been obviously very interested in my clients. Mm -hmm. I always sat down with them and listened to them. I wanted to know everything that they would, were willing to share in my sessions. Uh, but there was a point in my career, uh, this is now 10 years ago, that I realized I had never been interested in their profession. So I'd never been interested in leadership as such. Mm. I wasn't ambitious for leadership myself, so I'd never done a, a substantive leadership role like many other coaches. They come from senior management positions, for example. Um, so there was a, this moment that I suddenly realized I can define coaching, I know what it is, uh, I can listen to my clients, but do I know what they do? Do I understand their field of work? And I didn't. And, and that was the beginning of, uh, of the leadership shadow. Hmm. I started to read everything. I started to try to define what leadership is, what this profession was all about. I struggled a lot doing that. And I found I wasn't really alone. So there are other important authors who also struggled defining leadership. So I thought, or I came to the conclusion that this was an issue about leadership that we need to be uh, attentive to. And then over time, I discovered something about, um, it, it's technically called leadership derailment. Mm -hmm. So it's a kind of um, weakness after strength, uh, so that a leader who might be extremely successful over his or her career, that there's often a moment of truth um, or a fall from grace or something like that. There's very often a moment in a leader's career or even in an organization's life where things go wrong. Mm. And I began to understand that leadership comes with a shadow. So even if you're a very successful leader, you build up your own shadow. And I always feel like I'm doing it in the moment. I'm talking with you now, I'm doing 
my, my usual thought leadership and I think I know everything and I tell you about it and I'm in bright light and this is my outside and it's all very shiny and clear. And yet, even as I sit down here with you, mm-hmm. having all this thought leadership, I am now aware that I'm putting things back uh, behind me into my shadow. So all my doubts about coaching, all my uh, concerns about coaching outcome and, and coaching outcome research, all my doubts about leadership, um, I will not tell you about those because I'm answering your questions in a positive way. Mm-hmm. I will have to suppress them as it's technically called. So I have to put them somewhere in what I now call my shadow. Mm-hmm. Um, so the idea is that all leadership comes with a shadow. Well, it's interesting because you're, you're describing that what's in your shadow is more connected to m- more sort of worries and fears. The people that I work with, their shadows are a lot scarier than that. I you see. Think you can talk okay. about more of the shadows of someone who is a bit narcissistic or overly powerful. What have you seen there? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I'm, I have to admit, if I'm very honest with you, that even my own shadow is very scary and I'd rather not talk about that with you. But, uh, you know, when I started looking into this and mm-hmm. through my own psychoanalysis and so on, I discovered that it's not just my doubts about little pieces of theory, but there's also my passion, for example, in, in my work. Mm-hmm. So I'm a very passionate person which means I'm very much in the face of my colleagues sometimes, very demanding at work. Mm. And I sometimes may raise my voice uh, to them if I, if I want something in order to finish a piece of research or in order to win a new contract, which I really like to do and so on. So I realize even for myself that in my mm-hmm. shadow, there's not just these little doubts and fears, yeah, like but there's it. also a bit, of, <laughs> a bit of ugliness, let's say. Yeah. And in Sorry, everyone. I didn't answer your question, but no, in everyone, yes. But I also see it in clients. So yes. I, I also see, narci- you know, mm-hmm. people who are more narcissistic than me, uh, for mm-hmm. example, and, and lots but of these things. I think what you're saying is so important because it goes along to we have to own our own shadow mm. and we have to know what's going on in our own shadow mm. so that when we're sitting with the CEO who's got a very big shadow, We've been there ourselves. So it really yes. keeps yeah. us from judging the other person. Correct, we yes. We had it too. Maybe we're just a little smaller, so our shadow's a little smaller. <laughs> They're bigger, their shadow is bigger. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's you're answering your earlier question in a better way than I do. So that is the leadership shadow. The fact that you, as you acquire power mm-hmm. and you, 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 know, you have impact uh, at the same time, and you're not always, very often you're not aware of it, you build up this kind of hidden area. Yeah, and so it's about impact. Yes. The leader doesn't understand their impact from a shadow perspective. Yes, yes. Now, don't you think though that the shadow is somehow connected to your strengths? Uh, Yes, Um, I would say that. Like your passion on one side and maybe pushy on the other, something like that. Yeah, and you know, narcissism is also a kind of an ambition for greatness Mm-hmm. and uh, glory and glamour and maybe there's nothing wrong with that because that gives you a driver to achieve great things but of course if that then gets uh, this beast of narcissism gets fed through your career uh, mm-hmm. because you are achieving great things then you might you, you know it might turn into something more egotistical than it was originally and then it becomes more problematic so right. there's something called you you were mentioning narcissism just one example, but there is something like uh, healthy narcissism in my view. Right. Well, you, it, it seems to me healthy narcissism is I feel empowered to do things. I want to build great things. Yeah. I can do something. I'm self-confident. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I dare to go out and, you know, talk about what I want to see, etc. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You need a modicum of narcissism. The problem is once you get successful with that, uh, then it, it's more than a modicum. It becomes, you know, it grows on you. Well, then the whole issue is then when you are high up the food chain, you have a big shadow, nobody tells you the truth anymore. And Correct. you were talking about in your research when you looked at these 360s and it's like, what do, what, what do I think of myself and what do others think of me? The higher you go up, the bigger the gap is between you think you're great, maybe your people don't, but who's going to say anything to you? 
Absolutely, and, and what I would hope is that coaches have a place there, and maybe line managers as well. Uh, hopefully, if we can organize ourselves in better ways, then direct reports can, can, can do something. And we now have much more protection for uh, whistleblowers, for example, than we used to have five years ago. Mm, so yeah, things right. are moving in the right direction. Um, but yeah, it's difficult. And it's very difficult in a big, powerful organization to tell the leader that maybe they, uh, they're they not right this time. I think about um, a lot of the leaders that I've talked with, if I'll give them, I'll say something, they would say something like, if anybody else said this, I'd fire them. And so <laughs> yeah. I think you're exactly right that we're in this remarkable position yeah. as leadership coaches because we think back to your other research, because of the quality of the relationship, because of the leader's resilience, they will hear the truth from us because it's safe. Yes. And so then they can sort of look in the mirror. And, and my yes. guess is you've experienced that yourself quite a bit. I have, yeah. And it's, uh, it's a great skill, if you can, what you're just describing, that you can at the same time challenge them and be on their side. And that they really believe both things, that there is a, uh, you know, a, a, a kernel of truth in what you say, and also that you're saying it on their behalf. Yeah, yeah I have a rule inside myself, which is, um, so he here's the client. It's like, I am allowed to confront them this much only if I care about them that much. That you have to care about them and their safety, and then only then do you earn the right to confront them, because then they're willing to look at the shadow side of themselves and not get sort of blinded by feeling shame, or you know feeling just a sense of like, oh, who am I? Yeah. Because they see that you you like them and you respect them, and you can hold up the mirror. That's beautiful, Carol. Yeah. I agree with that. And I think from the other side, it's very similar, that they will trust you mm -hmm. as far as they feel they are, uh, are being understood by you. And they will share, you know, something from their shadow, from their doubts, concerns, mm -hmm. uh, conflicts. Mm -hmm. They will yeah. share that if they feel you're really on their side and you're really trying to understand. I would love to hear an example of how this works in your own practice when you have sat with a leader and talked about their shadow. What happened? Well, I can tell you about one female leader that I worked with quite a few years ago. And I think that's maybe safer in terms of confidentiality as well. Um, this was a, a, somebody working in economy and she was working alongside, she was working internationally, she's working directly with Angela Merkel and also with Christine Lagarde from mm. France. And wow. she said, these are two female role models that I meet in my work and I don't want to follow them. Uh, you know, one is, has this kind of masculine uh, exterior and the other one uses female seduction during meetings and I, I don't like either of these things and she also wanted to work on her relationship with her boss whom uh, who, who she thought was micromanaging her um, but when I then did some interviews around her people who worked for her her boss her peers her secretary maybe I don't remember um, then a whole different picture came out hmm. and it was about somebody who was extremely in, in in you know there was even one person who said oh are you coming from that person are you interviewing on behalf of this uh, leader in this organization then I'm not going to be open with you so because I don't trust her at all Wow um, she's very aggressive she's very egotistical uh, she's uh, you know very passionate about what she needs from you and then if she doesn't need anything then she just passes you on the corridor and doesn't say hello and so there were very very strong tales and we had to work on both the relationship with her boss and the relationship with uh, her peers mm -hmm. and um, yeah so that was hard work especially in the beginning when uh, these very uh, fractured, uh, you know, bruised relationships around her emerged mm -hmm. and we spoke mostly about that and she was initially not very happy with me because she thought the contract was going to be about, you know, becoming, a, she was. A, a, beca well, <laughs> becoming a, a great female leader of her own with her own signature presence and, and about her boss and, and really standing up to him. 
Uh, but initially, we couldn't, you know, we had to address these interviews. Um, so this is, an, uh, I think, an, an example of the leadership shadow mm -hmm. uh, with a lot of emotional volatility, as I would call it, yes. um, in the shadow. Uh, so this, uh, you know, she was not very self confident, uh, 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 she was self confident, but not very conscious of what she was generating right. in the office. So often that's exactly what happens. Yeah. <laughs> so it was what really in a. What happened? Mm? What happened? Um, we had, I think, is you know, very productive work together. Um, because she was a, a con a, a, an economist, we could frame uh, the kind of a relationship with her boss as a kind of a tax paying. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as yeah, a citizen, you have to pay taxes. So, as an employee, you have to answer all those micromanaging emails from your boss, and you have to maybe set aside half an hour a week to talk with him. Mm -hmm. And so we uh, we established that. And then um, I think on the more kind of uh, personal side, uh, I mean, there was a, a beautiful link towards the very final session when she told me that she had actually read the play Antigone when she mm. was 14. And not just once, but she read it again and again and again. And, you know, we talked about her tendency to be very courageous, very heroic, um, but also to run into kind of difficulties by standing up so much for uh, certain principles and, and things like that. So we could link this shadow uh, volatility with a kind of a courage that she also brought to the workplace. Mm -hmm. And I think that must have been somehow uh, a, a reframe also that, that helped her more to accept this part of her. Mm. Wonderful. And would you say at the end she established a better relationship with herself and her peers? What happened by the end? I would hope so. Let's put it that way. I didn't do interviews at, at the end, but uh, I, I do feel that this was an, a, a very productive mm -hmm. uh, collaboration that we had many years ago. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. It's so much like what we actually have to do every week. Thanks.